we talked about the fact that Solomon was very obedient to the Lord and the Lord blessed him exceedingly when he was a young man. And we're told that God said to him, this is God speaking to Solomon in 2 Corinthians 1.12, Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. He told him, I'll give you anything you ask for. He says, I'll give me wisdom and knowledge. And he says, you got it. So God does answer prayers, and oftentimes he does answer them the way we want. And he did this one because Solomon asked for the right thing. But he says, besides, since you asked for the right thing, I'm going to give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have ever had before you, nor shall any after you have the like. So we're going to turn back the clock to the early days of Solomon when God really is for him. Because our, our subject is this big word, if. And God was with him because Solomon was with God. God drew near to God, to Solomon because Solomon drew near to God. And, and we're happy to, to, to read these lessons of those who did the right things and God blessed them. And also those who did the wrong things and God cursed them. Because we don't have time to reinvent the wheel and learn everything by mis our own mistakes. And that's why God has recorded for us the victories and also the faults of those who have gone before. So that we can copy the one and avoid the other. And so we're going to trace the early days of Solomon when everything was going wonderful for him and also for the nation. And so in 2 Samuel 2 and 1, Solomon determined to build a temple for the name of the Lord. It was a good thing to do. David wanted to do it, but God says, no, you can't do it. Now David had the right attitude. God sometimes says no when we pray to him. And we really are glad in hindsight many times that God didn't give me what I asked for because what he gave me was much better than what I asked for. But David also had this, he wasn't a spoil sport. He said, well, if I can't build a temple, I'm not having anything to do with it. No, 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 no. He went all out to help prepare for the building of the temple that his son was going to build. God wouldn't let him do it, but he cooperated beautifully. And so Solomon determined to build a temple for the Lord. Now, what about you and me? Are we determined to build a temple for the Lord? We're going to look at the temple that was built and how it compares to us. Because there's spiritual lessons in the building of the temple, the literal temple in Jerusalem, and the building of the spiritual temple, which is going to be built, and you are part of that temple. The Lord Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, but he's also the chief building inspector, as we're going to see in a few minutes. But you see, not everybody determines to build a temple for the Lord. I've got to build my own career, my own house. And so Haggai uh, criticized those later on when he said, is it time for you to dwell in your panel houses? This temple lies in ruins? What are you doing? Your house is an apple pie order. Your garden is beautiful. You're so involved, but you're neglecting the temple of the Lord. Have you ever known a Christadelphian who did that? Oh, they had a beautiful home. They worked on it all the time. Garden, no weeds. But ask them to come for a work day at the hall. Oh, I'm busy. I'm having a special lecture. Well, I'm, I'm involved. I've got, I've got something else to do. Whose temple are we building? Ours or the Lord's? In those days, they were condemned for that. And God said, consider your ways. You have so much and you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you earn wages and you put them in a bag that has a hole in the bottom. <laughs> Talk about inflation. <laughs> Talk about the stock market. You put your money in and it goes away. <laughs> uh, they were giving their life to the things of this world? And the answer was, consider your ways. And so, brothers and sisters, consider your ways. Put the building of the Lord's house ahead of your own. And some people do, and some people don't. Now, we're told that it took seven years for Solomon to build the temple. It also tells us that he took 13 years to build his own house. Now, now, I would like to think that Solomon really put more people to work 
And, and they worked overtime to build that temple. And when he went to well, his own house, he just worked regular 40 hour a week. <laughs> Take a little bit longer. But we're not told that. It's not a good idea to speculate on things we're not told. But, but here's the spiritual lesson we want to think. And it's in 1 Kings chapter 6, and verse 7. And he talks about what was happening while the temple was being built. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stones finished at the quarry. So that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was hurt in the temple while it was being built. Now, I don't know if you've been privileged to go to Jerusalem, but it's a wonderful thing to do. I know some Christians don't want to go until it's in its glory. And that's all right. I honor that. But I was thrilled to walk the streets what Jesus walked, to look at the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed, to go on the Mount of Olives. Brother Ashton talked about that this morning. And you had a wonderful view of the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. But if you go to Jerusalem, you want to go outside the wall and go down below to a place called King Solomon's Quarries. And what they did, they, they, they quarried this rock, out of, it's soft limestone rock, and they dug this cave, and they made these huge blocks. They were about 12 feet long. They're about, three, about as high as this table square, and 12 feet long. And, and the whole, it's a huge cave, and it's, it, it was built as a man-made cave because they took the rocks out of there, these stones, and they prepared them. Uh, for the temple. Then they had to haul them up. I don't know how they got them up there, up the hill, to build the temple. And that's what he says, you see. The stones were finished at the quarry. Now what happened is, they, they knew the exact measurement of each stone that was supposed to go into the temple. And so they built it, and they, they prepared the stones down in the below before they brought them up. And so there were little bumps on them and, 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 and knots and Flaws, they chiseled them off, they sanded them off, they, they prepared them for that. Now there's a spiritual lesson for that because you see, you and me, we're, we're stones for this future temple. And right now we're being prepared to, make, to fit into that temple when Jesus comes. And unfortunately, we all have some bumps on us. <laughs> we have some little places that need to be knocked off. The Lord is chiseling on us and sanding us and buffeting us right now, preparing us to be a building block in the spiritual temple when Jesus comes. Now, stones cannot talk, but if stones could cry out, and a, and a fellow's guy with a chisel, and he's hitting like that, that's, oh, that really hurts. And so when you're being chiseled right now by the Lord, it, oh, it hurts. No chastening for the presence even to be joyous, but grievous. It's afterward that yield the peaceable fruits of righteousness unto them who are exercised thereby. And so right now, you are, you are being prepared for the temple. And Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but he's also the chief building inspector. And he's getting us ready for the temple. Because if we got to the building site and we didn't fit, because the little bumps here in a place there, we would be rejected. And that's what we don't want to have happen. So accept the little chiseling and the preparing, the trials that are, you're having now. It's, it's helping you. They're good. They're for your good. God loves you. He's per, he wants to give you these little problems to get you ready so that you can be in the kingdom. He wants to be for us. And we have to be willing to accept the problems of, 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 the, of the trials that we're going, undergoing now in order that we'll be acceptable to him then. And so, during the time that this temple is going into construction, of course, God oversaw the whole thing. He knew everything was going on. And in 1 Kings 6, 11, uh, God talks to Solomon, and the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, concerning this temple, which you're building, oh, it's that big little word again, if, if you walk in my statutes, if you execute my judgment, if you keep all my commandments, and if you walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the temple and he finished it. So now the temple has been built, the seven years are over, and now they're going to dedicate it. So now I do want you to turn to Second Chronicles, please, uh, chapter 6, because we're just going to skim through this, but we're just going to pick out words here and there because we're talking about if God be for us. So Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord, and this is chapter 6, 
going in at verse 12, and he spread out his hands. Why did he tell him that? You see, body language is important. He, he was open to God. Whenever I look at an audience like this, and I see people sitting like this, you know what I know? You're turning me off. You're not, you're not getting through to me. Oh, I'm not going to listen to you. Your uh, body language just tell me that. I see you like this. Wow, you're getting it. <laughs> so we, we, body language is real important. So God is actually describing some as body language. So he says he, he spread out his hands. But now, now, where was he? Now, I'm standing on a platform. There's about four little steps, and here I am. Uh, Solomon was on a platform, too. We're told about it. We told him the size of it. Solomon had made a brazen platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide, three cubits high. So it was taller than this. So if I was on a platform three cubits high, I'd be bumping my head on the chandelier, maybe. And I'm not very tall, but I would still would do it. It's tall enough, tall, tall enough platform. And now we're, he's got, we're back to body language again. And it was when Solomon had finished praying all the prayer and the supplication of the Lord that he rose from before the altar from the Lord, kneeling on his knees. So we know we, we've got Solomon down on the... You could all see him because you're, you're, he's so up tired there, but he's down on his knees. And uh, we're going to read what he prayed. And he was writing by inspiration... And it's been recorded for us. And Solomon begins a beautiful prayer, beginning at verse 14, and the prayer goes all the way to verse 42. We will not read all of that. We'll just pick out a word here and now, because the word we're talking about is that little word, if. Verse 22, if a man sin against his neighbor. Verse 24, if thy people Israel be put to the worst before their enemies. This is Solomon talking to God about the children of Israel. Verse 26, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin. Verse 28, if there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, if there be blasting, if there enemies besiege them. Verse 34, if thy people go out to war. Verse 36, if they sin against thee, for there's no man that sinneth not. We know that's true, only the Lord Jesus. Verse 37, if they bethink themselves in the land, whether they be carried captive. Solomon already was able by being a prophet to know that they were going to disobey, they were going to be captured and taken away from Jerusalem, and they're going to be captive in other countries. Verse 38, if they return to thee with their whole heart and their whole soul. So if, if God be for us, if you turn to God, he will. And that's, so Psalm was praying to Heavenly Father, if the children of Israel do these things and they turn to you, hear their prayer. And so in 1 Kings 8, you keep your finger there, but in 1 Kings 8, we're told that when Solomon finished praying this prayer, that he rose from the, kneeling before the altar and on his knees. And he stood in a blessed assembly with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord who hath given rest to his people, Israel, according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised to his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us. If God be for us, if you turn your life over to God, the answer is he will be. So he was down on his knees. He was not ashamed to get on his knees in front of a multitude of people. He was the king. Kings are usually having people bow to them. He's bowing to the king, to the God, our heavenly father. And he's down on his knees. And God is really for Solomon. And he's really for the children of Israel. And it's a, it's a happy time. We, we, we enjoy reading about happy times. And because they were doing the right things, it was a happy time. And so in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 12, the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, Now we pray. I was so pleased last night to be in on the audience when Brother Michael showed us his book on prayer. I just I went out and bought it. He's a good salesman. <laughs> And I recommend that all of you get one of those. Because prayer is, that's our subject today, is we're going to get to it in a minute, is on prayer. Because uh, it's one of the most important things we can do. It's a gift from God to us. And so, but we don't hear God saying to us at the end of our prayer, we say amen, and we hear a voice saying, I heard your prayer. But we know he does. 
He promises effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. So we know he, he does, but God says to Solomon, I have heard your prayer, and I've chosen this place for me as a house of sacrifice. Now, God is going to talk about the future here to Solomon. When I shut up heaven, and there's no rain. See, God does this. Or command the locusts to devour the land. Or send pestilence among my people. If, back to that little word, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God says, if you just turn to me, I'll turn to you. And if you don't feel close, close to God, who, to, who moved away? It wasn't God. So it's a happy time. And so in the, in the Kings we read that Solomon held a feast for all Israel, a great assembly, and he had it for seven days. Now just imagine, here we are at Chippensburg Bible School, and we're having a marvelous time. This is a little foretaste of the kingdom when we can all be together and share fellowship together and share meals together, except this is going to end. But what, what, what would happen if at the end of Saturday night we just told the Shippensburg people, we've had such a wonderful week, we're going to stay another week. <laughs> well, of course they wouldn't let us, because I'm sure they got it booked for somebody else next week. But, 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 but Solomon was in control, so that's what they did. Uh, they, they, they were before the Lord seven days, and they, they, so they did another seven days, 14 days. And on the eighth day, he sent the people away. And they blessed the king and went to their tents, joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people. What a happy time we're reading about here. God is for them. They are for God. And everybody is being blessed. He's pouring out blessings upon them more than you can imagine. And that's what God will do for us if, if we put him first in our life. But if we turn from God and decide to please ourselves and do what we want to do, then he's going to turn and be our enemy. And you can't win if God is not for you. And so, what do we do to make sure that we don't turn from God? Well, we stay away from sin as much as we possibly can. And so I have made up a silly story. You, you can tell it's silly, and you can tell it's not true. But you ladies, you ladies like to go to the mall. You, you, you like to shop. My wife loves to shop till she drops. And I drop even before I shop. <laughs> but we, but you go, you're in the mall, and you're going down the center aisle, and the store's on both sides. And, you, and you're just looking, and all of a sudden you see a store packed with people. You know, oh, wow, that's, that sure is a busy place. And you say, what are they selling there? And you see this big neon sign that says, Sin Store. Ooh. Well, I wouldn't buy anything, but I might just go in and look. So we go inside the Sin Store, and the cash register's going, and boy, I mean, it, it's a busy place. Now, you see, God is totally honest. Sin is fun. If it wasn't fun, we wouldn't do it. We're told that Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So sin is fun, but it doesn't last very long. And so you're in the store, and the people are buying these sins just like crazy. And they're all very attractively packaged. And you look on the shelf, oh, look at that one. Woo-wee! I'd never done that, but I should, oh, that would be fun, wouldn't it? I'll just look and see how much it costs. So you go up to the shelf, and you take the, the sin down, and you look at it, and oh, it sure looks, and you look at the price. Death! <laughs> <laughs> and you put it back. And then you, you go on the other side, and you say, oh, look at that one. Oh, I'll, I'll see how much it costs. Death! <laughs> Say, are you the manager of the store? And you say, yeah. I said, don't you ever have a sale around here? <laughs> and he says, we never mark down the price of sin. It's always death. But sometimes we throw in 20 years of misery as a bonus. <laughs> and that's the story of the sin store. And the moral of the story is don't go shopping 
at the sin store. Stay as far away from sin as you possibly can. Because when you shop there, you didn't think you would buy something, but you know, people say, I would never do that. I would never do that. I would never do that. Never in the world would I do that. Uh, oh. <laughs> we, we, we so often, because we're so frail, get too close to sin. And next you think, well, we've done it. So stay away from the sin story is the moral of that silly little story. But right now, things are going very well. And Solomon is in favor with God. And God is in favor with Solomon. And so he appears to him in the dream and he says, I have heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself. And God has chosen you Brother Matt talked about that in his class the other day. He's picked us and he's preparing us for the kingdom. And it's going to hurt. You're going to have the bumps knocked off you. And so if you don't have them knocked off you, you won't be acceptable uh, for God when Christ comes. So we do want to talk about our prayer life. It was Brother Michael uh, spent the after evening, late evening in it. And you can't talk about it too much, but he said something that I've surely agreed with. I feel inadequate talking about prayer. You say, well, I pray, you pray, we, we all pray, but how, how satisfied are we with our prayer? Could, could our prayer life be better than it is now? Um, if any of them think they can't improve on that, they'll tell, tell other lies besides. <laughs> There's a little thing that I like. It's not scripture, but, it, but, it's, but, it's, but it's very true. You can do more th than pray when you have prayed. But you can never do more than pray until you have prayed. So not, prayer is not all we should do, but it should be done first. Pray before you do anything. I was telling the kids uh, about Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a favorite party uh, fellow of mine. And he was the cup, king's cupbearer. And he used to take the wine up and give it to the king. And uh, the rule was when you're in front of the king, you smile. No, kings don't want to be around any goopy people, sad people. You know, they had court gestures just to make the king laugh. And so Nehemiah has been praying for months for this big moment. And he's got the wine in his hand. And he's going in to see the king. And he's been praying. Now he's been praying for months. And he gets to the king, and he has to take a taste first, make sure he doesn't drop dead, you know. Then the king will drink it after you take the first sip. Now, we have a place over our way called Disneyland, and the people who work there are taught that you smile when you go out. They, they have the, the, the rooms where they, they prepare and dress up in whatever they're going to dress, ticket takers, whatever they are. But when you go through that door, on the inside of the door, nobody, the public never sees it, it says, smile. <laughs> and the penalty for not smiling in Disneyland is unemployment. <laughs> and the penalty for not smiling in front of a king is death. And so Nehemiah is taking the wine to the king. <laughs> Without saying a word, the king says, what's the matter with you? <laughs> Scripture says he was petrified. Now you think he says, now wait, wait just a minute, king. I'll put your wine down. I'm going to get down here. No, that was one of those quickie prayers. <laughs> but the Nehemiah says, Nehemiah prayed, and then he gave him the wine. And then he explained why he was so discouraged. And God, and, and God blessed him. Everything he asked for, the, the, the king gave him. See, he opened the windows of heaven for Nehemiah. But, but he had to take a risk. He risked his life, in a sense, to do that. So you can do more than, you can do more when you have prayed, but you can never do more until you have prayed. And so uh, before anything you do, Pray about it first. It's impossible to lose your footing when you're on your knees. And I like that saying because it shows that that's a good place to be when you are praying on your knees. And Sol Solomon 
was on his knees. We're told that. And we know Daniel was on his knees. On his knees, three times a day with the windows open. And they, these enemies of, of Daniel, and we do have enemies. You can't help going, if you won't stand for something, you know, if you stand for the truth, you're going to have some enemies. If you let people know you're standing up for the truth, you will make enemies. No, you don't go out to try to make enemies. Look at the enemies that the Lord Jesus had. <clears throat> because he went around doing good and healing the sick and, and, and helping everybody, they hated him. So you have to expect some people to dislike you. And we have to love them and pray for them and keep right on doing what's right no matter what. So the, Daniel is high up in the government of the king of Babylon and all of his enemies want to get something on him. Now just think about this for a minute. If I wanted to really get something on you, if I, if, if I were you and I'm not, you know, is there anything that, that I could say truthfully about you that is uncomplimentary? It, it, he never returns his phone calls. <clears throat> he doesn't really finish his work on time if you, he's an uh, employer. Uh, there was nothing they could get on Daniel except one thing he prayed. <laughs> so the only way they could get to Daniel was to convince the king to make this silly rule and anybody appeals to anybody but me for 30 days would be cast in the den of lions. Uh, the, the king was stupid to do it, but they were out to get Daniel. And the king was not out for Daniel, but he felt sad. But once he signed that Medes and Persian law, there was no change in that. Now, if I'd been Daniel, and I knew they were watching me, see, I'm more devious than Daniel. I would have said, God, it's only for 30 days. I'll tell you what I'll do. I, I, I'm not going to stop praying, Father. I'll just go call in bed, and I, they'll look in the window, and they'll think I'm asleep. But I'll be in bed praying. But I won't be on the side of the bed on my knees just for 30 days. After that, okay? And God, Daniel didn't do that. Daniel did what was right no matter what. And if, it, if you cost your life to pray, then pray. Fortunately, we're not in a position where, where that, it, we pay, that's a penalty. But, but we have to put God first no matter what. If God be for us, but if you make excuses for not doing what he said, he won't be for us. And so Daniel was a man of prayer, as we know. And our, our eternal life depends on us being men and women, brothers and sisters, of prayer. Now, if you think anyone maybe didn't need to pray, it would be the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he was the Son of God. He had the Holy Spirit without measure. He had an unlimited power, and yet he was a man of prayer. Now, it came to pass in those days that Jesus went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. I frequently wake up in the night and pray, but I have never, ever prayed all night long to God. But Jesus did. Another place, so he drew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And then in Hebrews, we're told, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears, he was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, that, it's a strange verse for me to remember so fervently, but I can remember being in the hospital, and I had tubes coming out all, every part of me practically, and I couldn't move, and I hurt everywhere. <laughs> and this is the verse I kept saying over and over. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. I didn't have a Bible with it. It was one of the, in the in, 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 I brought one of the, to the hospital, but I couldn't even reach it. I was, I was a fixed where I couldn't move hardly. But I, could, I knew that verse, and I kept thinking, if God caused his son to suffer, to learn obedience, and he never sinned, it wasn't that he was having any bumps knocked off to him. I can take this because God won't try me more than I can bear. So I just say, God, just help me through it. And I did. God, God delivered me. I never thought I'd be back here, and here I am. And, and God has blessed me exceedingly abundantly above all I could ask or think. But I, I, 
I totally turned everything over to God. I, I, I fully expected to die. I, when, when they told me I was going to have open heart surgery, I just had a major surgery. And my daughter is a, a camera nut. And they were taking me down to the, to the operating room to take out my heart. <laughs> Doctor said to my son, I held your dad's heart in my hand for 40 minutes. They open your body up and they take it out and hold it, work on it, and then put it back in. <laughs> Hope it starts. <laughs> and it did. <laughs> But, but he even showed me this machine. They, t they took me down the day before to show me the heart-lung machine. That's going to be your, your heart and lung for, for hours tomorrow. So I'm on my way down. We've got a little bonnet on my head. I'm in the, in the gurney going down. And here's my daughter running ahead of me. And she gets back and she takes a picture of me coming down. I thought, last picture taken of me alive. <laughs> I remember thinking that. It wasn't true, you see. I was too much of a pessimist. But this was a verse that kept coming to my mind. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And so don't complain about your suffering. God is allowing it. He may not be causing it. You may have done something stupid and, 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 and climbed up on a ladder and fallen off and hurt yourself. But he certainly allowed it because his angels could have stopped you from falling. But if you do something stupid, you, if you lay down a railroad track, you're going to get run over. I mean, we don't tempt God at all. But, but if, if you turn your life over to God and, and you're trying your best to serve him, then whatever thing is happening to you is working out for your best, your ultimate best. All things, not some things, all things, all the time work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And so prayer has to be a very big part of our life. But it's not the only part. I, I know some people who pray a lot, never read the Bible. We had a sister in our ecclesia. She used to come to my house. I was getting ready to go to Australia on a trip, and she was studying for baptism, and she wanted to come twice a week. And I was really trying to get ready. But she wanted to come twice a week. She came twice a week. So we studied for her baptism because she couldn't spell Bible when she started. But, and she was baptized and her husband, and, and then she left him and left the truth. She came into my office one day, and I, her name was Mary, and I said, Mary, are you doing your Bible reading? She said, no, no, Bob, I'm really busy at work right now, but I pray all the time. I just keep on praying. You know what Solomon said? He said, if, if you don't read the Bible, don't bother to pray. Do you, know, you know the Bible said that? I sometimes quote that. It's a very loose, tra it's a Bob Lloyd translation. <laughs> The verse says, he who turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. So God is saying through Solomon that if you won't read the Bible, I'm not going to listen to your prayers. Because you see, when we open our Bible, God talks to us. When we pray, we talk to God. And he wants both. But the people who want to pray all the time and don't bother to read the Bible, don't bother. He's not going to listen to you. So if you want God to be for you, you have to do these two things, and you have to do them all the time. You must read the Bible. Not just your daily readings, but study. Study to show that self approved in the God. Workmen need not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Make this your companion all day long, and then take it to the Lord in prayer. And then he will hear your prayer, and he will be for you. And if you leave out one of those... He won't be for you. If you just read the Bible but never pray, you got it wrong. If you read, pray and don't read the Bible, you got it wrong. So Solomon is, we're still with Solomon. And in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, he says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, this is God talking, and pray and seek my face and turn their wicked way, from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal them. So attitude is everything in prayer. We must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will lift us up. Jesus talked about a man who had a terrible disease. You, you, you've heard of it before. I'm only stirring up your pure minds by way of remembrance. You all know these things. But we're trying to put them all together to, to, to make a point we hope you'll remember. This fellow had this medical disease called I-itis. And Jesus describes this, the symptoms of this disease. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed with himself. <laughs> he wasn't praying to God. He was just talking to himself. 
God didn't hear this prayer. Not that he couldn't hear it, but he chose not to. He did say, God, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extorters, unjust, adulterers, even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. I, 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 I. God didn't hear the prayer. The tax collector stood in far as, would not so much as even lift up his eyes to heaven. And he hit himself on his chest and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so Jesus comments as this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For whoever will exalt himself will be humbled and he will humble himself will be exalted. And so you're talking to Almighty God when you pray. And you call him any time of the day or not. You're never going to be put on hold. He's never going to be out. <laughs> you can reach him any time. Nehemiah, even standing before the king with a cup, he prayed. I know that was a short one, but he, I know he prayed long prayers besides. But, but we ought to be a praying people. We talked about praying and even driving a car. It's a good idea. And so I want to share with you one of my prayers. It's going to be a handout you receive at the end of this class. And uh, I'll read it to you in more authorized versions. And we even have a hymn about it. Be, be careful for nothing. The Lord is at hand. Be in, in New King James, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But I like that verse in a different translation. It's called the Phillips translation. And this is going to be the handout you receive today. And this is how it goes. Don't worry over anything, whatever. Tell God every detail of your needs in earnest and thankful prayer, and the peace of God which transcends human understanding will keep constant God over your hearts and minds as they rest in Christ Jesus. I tell you, I said that prayer many a times in that hospital. Don't worry over anything, whatever. Tell God every detail of your needs. He knows, but he wants you to voice them to him. He, he cares. We, he will be for you. He will deliver you if that's his will. And sometimes it isn't. He gives his beloved sleep. So it's all right. If you die in the Lord, that's fine. That's the, way, that's the way to do it. Nobody's ever gotten out of this life alive. Not even Jesus. And so we're born to die unless Christ comes prior to our death and takes us away. So... What do you do when you don't feel like praying? You, sometimes I've had people say, well, I just, I just, I just, just don't, I don't know what to say. I, my prayers are dry. Well, we do have, go through different moods. Well, then get your hymn book out. Just read a few hymns. The hymn book is full of prayers. We come, O God, to bow before thy throne. Now, you, you can, if, if you can't think to say these words, then read them. To pay our solemn vow through thy dear Son. He is our high priest there. To incense faithful prayer. Hear, gracious Father, hear. His spirit's grown. So, David and the Psalms. That was a hymn book, but just turn to the Psalms. The Psalms are full of prayers. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come unto you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily. God does answer. He doesn't always answer it the way we wanted him to, but he answered it the way that's right for us. And all things will work together for our good. Not some, but all. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. Brethren and sisters, make your life a life of prayer and of reading the scriptures. When you read the Bible, God talks to you. And when you pray, you talk to him. And it's wonderful. But if you leave out one of those, you're trying to walk on one leg, you cannot 
make progress in your life. And so our subject for the week is if God be for us, and we want the answer to be yes, and to do that we have to surrender our life to God, we have to commit our life to Him, and you do that in prayer. And be sure you listen to your own prayers. Unfortunately, it is possible to memorize certain words and, and then just say them uh, like, like by rote. They used to have talking dolls. I never got one for my kids, but it had a little prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I hope, pray the Lord my soul to take. If I was a kid and prayed that, I'd be scared to go to sleep. <laughs> but, but sometimes we can pray in such a way that we're not even listening to what we're praying. I mean, when you pray for your food, we, we, we do that, we're going to do it now for, for our lunch today. And of course, the brother who's going to give that prayer will be, have thought through it in advance because he's praying for all of us. But at your own home, have you ever had this happen at home? You, you're rushing around, it's breakfast time, and everybody's got to get off, get off to work or school or everything. And you get the food on the table, and you say, you're going to say a prayer, and you say a little prayer. He says, oh, somebody forgot the milk. Go get the milk. Get the milk. Okay, we're going to say a prayer. Do we say a prayer? Well, we're going to get a case. I, I mean, what does God think if you're praying to him and you're not listening? You're not listening. You want him to listen to you, and you don't even listening to him. Isn't that ironic? I, I mean, when I, I, I love to talk to people, but sometimes when I meet some of you here, like in a Bible school, I'll have a fellow, I say, well, hi, Bob, how are you? And he's off, to, you know, and, you know, it's just a formality. He doesn't really know, I, 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 Lombago, does he? he didn't wait for me to tell him about it. <laughs> and, and if ever I notice that you speak to me and your eyes are glazing over, I may something, say something stupid, <laughs> which I do a lot of times. Anyway, I remember when our, our daughters, I have one of my daughters here, Sister Cheryl Robinson, and when they were little, they were about, they were 14 months apart, but they, they were, Linda grew a little bigger, so they were the same size. My wife used to sew dresses for them, just alike. And I can remember walking down the street uh, with a little girl in each hand in a, in a shopping mall or someplace, not the sin store. <laughs> And people say, oh, aren't they cute? Are they twins? And I say, no, they're six months apart. They say, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> because if pe people ask questions, then they don't want to know the answer. I, I said more, to more Christian elephants, how are you? They ask me, how are you? I said, I'm dying. This is good. You know, and they're gone. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is, People are offended if they see you're not listening to what they're saying. Now, what about God? The Heavenly Father, creator of heaven and earth. And you're praying to him. And you're not even concentrating in your own heart what you're saying. I wonder how much that prayer is heard by his fa our Father. He can choose which ones he hears. He, didn't do, he, didn't, he chose not to hear the one that uh, the Pharisee gave, effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man of of much. So brothers and sisters, uh, we need to make our lives a, a matter of a prayer life and a Bible reading life. Because if these are the two things we need to do for us to have God for us. Now, that's the end of the second class, but Brother Al Brittle has commissioned me to give a commercial. <laughs> He's told me about the literature at the back of the table there. All kinds of free literature. It's all free just to take it. There's 3,000 pieces up back there, he says. I haven't counted them. But I carry some of these on my person at all times. Every time, my wallet always has one of these in it. Answering your questions about Christadelphians. It's just real little. You just fold it up and stick it in the wall. It fit in a purse, and I'll say to somebody, I'm a Christadelphian, and say, well, what's that? <laughs> well, they asked, didn't they? <laughs> I'm, only for, I'm only answering their question, answering your question, answering your questions about Christadelphians. So I think we all ought to be a walking billboard for the truth. 
Because you never know. You're just sowing seeds. You don't know where the seeds are going. It's not, it's not your problem. You, 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 you don't make them grow. God makes it grow. But we should be doing that if we want to have God for us too. So, so Brother Al's uh, suggestion that I make to you, and I'm, I'm, I'm repeating his words, he was one of the star starters of this Bible school, as you know. He also was one of the starters of the Wilbraham Bible School. He's been a wonderful brother, and so happy that he's still with us at 92, and still can come and, and worship with us. And So this was his idea. I don't, don't want to take any credit for it. But I, it's a great idea, and I commend to you all, be, be sure to take up some literature. And don't worry over anything whatever. Tell God every detail of your needs in earnest and thankful prayer. And the peace of God, which transcends human understanding, will keep constant guard over your hearts and minds as they rest in Christ Jesus.